I signed up in 66. I went in um, to the Army Apprentice School. I wasn't an ordinary Joe Soap. I went through the Apprentice School in Nice. Uh, the 15th of April, 1975. It was the 1969. A peacekeeper is uh, somebody that his mission is to keep the peace. There are two missions that the UN basically go on. One is peacekeeping and the other is peace enforcing. Peacekeeping is you're more in a police role, uh, as in a, an ordinary policeman. You are not allowed to uh, instigate action unless there's action taken against you. I transfer from uh, basically from the depot to the 6th Battalion, and then from the 6th Battalion to 6th Battalion transport. So I never actually left that alone until 1970. I came up here to Rock Hill. Rock Hill, Camp Arrow at the beginning, but I, I didn't experience Camp Arrow as such, and uh, landed in Rock Hill as a, as a mechanic. We were sleeping on the front lawn in Rock Hill. Now, there was no chandeliers, nothing like that. And um, yeah, it was quite interesting because you had the people from all over basically the island. You had the Galway, uh, Galway Mullingar at Lowen, mainly the Western Command. Trained in the infantry, I trained in Cushion Barracks in Athlone. And then we moved to Fenner Camp then, uh, later on in the summer of 75, where we'd done our second phase of training there. And uh, I remained there for a year or so then as a private, an uh, infantry private. And then I transferred back to Athlone then again, and uh, served there for about 13 years. Uh, you got to know an awful lot of people, meet an awful lot of people. You were closer, would you believe me, than with your own family. That's how close you got. And well, you acted the same way you fought amongst one another, just every bit as much. Wasn't so much fighting as banter, but at the same time, as we used to say, first and best rest. The 1978 then Lebanon started up, so we went to Lebanon and so kind of changed the ring. ABC News has learned that Israeli armed forces have completed preparations for a military attack into Lebanon and U.S. officials believe will strike within a few days, probably this weekend. Uh, the Lebanon then in 81, 85, 86, 87. In the, in the 70s, uh, I, think this, I think the Lebanese Civil War started probably in 1975, 76. And there was two big things in the 70s. Well, three if you count Northern Ireland. Northern Ireland was one of the things that was making the news. The other thing was the end of the Vietnam War in 75. Uh, but the big thing that was coming on a lot of people's screens was the situation in Lebanon. And first of all, it started off with a civil war. And I think you had basically the, the Christian militias in uh, Lebanon who were Maronite Christians uh, there. And the, uh, the Lebanese Shiites and Sunni Muslims fought several battles with the Palestinians probably taking the side of their uh, Arab friends, the, the Shiites and that. Uh, so the Lebanon uh, was making news. The first trip I'd on there now, I I spent 17 trips abroad altogether, and I've done 14 and 11. And... Well, the first time, because we had such a, a little time, we, I think we basically had two weeks maximum. Uh, we were told on a Tuesday, I remember we were sent down to Athlone. We formed up in Athlone because C Company was a company drawn from the Western Command, and Athlone is the headquarters of the Western Command. So we went down there, and uh, the medics were actually putting an injection in one arm, another in injection in the other arm, and another one up your backside. Our, our clothing um, uh, wasn't very adequate at all, um, not suitable for a hot climate. Because everything had to be done, we were got given brand new rifles, so we had to get them and we had to boil the grease off them, and all the equipment was brand new. The only thing I would say is that when we arrived in Lebanon, we were wearing the Irish Army winter clothing. In other words, 
when we were told they were going, they said you have to wear your full combats. And unfortunately, full combats back then was a big wooden scarf, big thick socks, the heavy Irish army, old combat, not like the one they have nowadays. So we arrived out in Tel Aviv, we got off the plane, and as soon as we got off the plane on the 23rd of uh, uh, May 1978, the heat hit us, and we were formed up on the, in the middle of the tarmac in uh, Tel Aviv airport. And some of the lads were dropping like flies until somebody had the sense to take us into a, one of these air-conditioned uh, aircraft hangars. And we were issued with summer dress out there. Um, there were leftovers from Cyprus and maybe the Congo. Um, they were about 10 sizes too big for you. So we all had to get them tailored out there. So you were wearing your Irish um, combat uniform for the first few weeks until you got something tailored that you could actually wear. I was the 49th in, in 81, and then I was the, the, the 13th component or the 57th Battalion in 85, and then the 60th Battalion, I was pipe band sergeant there with the 6th Battalion, or with the 60th Battalion. So uh, conditions then as well, uh, living in tents, living in uh, derelict houses. Um, and we went there, it was a winter trip, so we went there in November or thereabouts. So you had about three months of pretty cold, well, wet and windy weather ahead of you. You had big old heavy radios that you were carrying about you, the, you know, when you were doing the, the foot patrols. And, and out there as well too, uh, the local people only had uh, electricity for about two hours a day. So it was like, if you're out in an outpost, it's like the, being on the far side of the moon uh, because there was no lights. The only lights you could see dotted around the landscape were uh, UN posts that had generators. It was completely dark and uh, the, the power only came on really for people when they were cooking meals or whatever. And But, but uh, that was it, like, you know, so... It was um, barren times, like living in a tent, maybe four, five, six kilometers away from your headquarters. And uh, could maybe only 10 out there in an outpost, very isolated, so. Prior to the invasion, it was a lot more intense because the Israelis had uh, uh, the South Lebanon army, which was basically a Israeli backed militia that we used to confront on a regular basis and we used to have to turn them back because they weren't allowed to come through our checkpoint, even though they would wanted to come through to get up to the back of the village and all that there. So we had more concentrations dealing with them up to then because of the the situation we had. Some of them even turned to fisticuffs where we literally used to batter the sh each other up, you know, because basically we only used force with the force that was used against us. And sometimes they would come along and they would try and force their way through and we would use maybe occasionally the odd warning shot, very rarely, but we would generally, because a lot of us are Irish and we're well able to talk, we used to convince them to go back. You know, well, this is the case. And then you would occasionally have to deal with the Israelis, but there was nothing we could do. We had no mandate to interfere with their uh, operations in Lebanon. So. If we stop people at a checkpoint or whatever, and next thing uh, they will get on the radio, within 15, 20 minutes, there'll be an Israeli patrol there. So we just had to let them move through because the Israelis controlled the area. We had, we had no mandate to interfere with. But uh, in 81 was a bad year for Letterkenny, for uh, UN, for the Irish soldiers there because that was one of the incidents where there was an Irish soldier killed in action. Uh, and I was a section commander at the time, and I sent him out to an outpost, and I'm sure you've heard of his name, Hugh Doherty, 27th of April, 1981. And I sent him out to the outpost with Kevin Joyce, who never was never found. Uh, we came back uns unscathed, but uh, poor Hugh, he was only, he wasn't even on the or original list, he was a, a, a reserve for the trip and some boy cried off it there and he got on uh, last last minute and uh, we were only six days in the Lebanon when that happened. Unfortunately it was, that was the way things went but uh, I always remember those especially the, the masses and the commemoration days and things like that. It's just a thing that is stuck 
in the head. Good evening from Versailles, the ornate palace outside Paris, where the end of the Seven Nation Economic Summit today was completely overshadowed by an Israeli invasion of Lebanon. Israeli tanks and troops, backed by air and sea bombardment, crossed into Lebanon before dawn, the aim to destroy Palestinian guerrilla bases. I was actually there in 1982 with C Company 51st Battalion. Uh, I was based in a place, I was the post commander uh, in post 621, which was Bait Jahoon. Now, Bait Jahoon was uh, basically a village near the crossroads that led from the, uh, the IDF uh, control area into the UN area. And Rubicon was the code word that, that was supposed to be given by the former troops in the event of a major Israeli invasion. But on the morning of the 6th of June, uh, I was post commander at 621 by Jahoon, and along with uh, other members of uh, my mortar platoon, uh, when uh, Sergeant Jimmy Flanagan, who was up in the tower, shouted down to me and he says to me, there's a couple of tanks moving on the Snake Road. Now the Snake Road was a road leading from the Israeli border down through Safalhaya into Kunin and on into Bay Jahoon, which takes you straight on up into north of into the Tani River and up towards Beirut. So Jimmy said there's a tank moving and then he says, hold on a minute, there's a couple of tanks moving, which wasn't unusual because sometimes they would start up their tanks and they would drive down to their checkpoint, which was forwarded us near the village of Kunin, and they would turn around and go back up again. But within seconds of that then, we heard this massive explosion and that was an F-16 breaking the sound barrier over our heads. And Flanagan just turned to me, shouted down to me and he says, forget about it, it's Rubicon. There's thousands of them coming down the road at us. Good evening. The Israelis have been claiming sweeping successes in their invasion of South Lebanon, but diplomatic efforts to get them to withdraw have been gaining strength. The Israelis claimed this evening to have captured the Palestinian strongholds of Tyre and Nabatea. Earlier, they said they'd taken Beaufort Castle and Hasbaya. There was also a bombing raid on the PLO headquarters in Beirut. Reports say the Israelis are now 17 miles south of the capital, and there's been a sea landing north of Sidon. The first tank that actually approached the checkpoint, our checkpoint, we put out what, it was only a token gesture because we were lightly armed. Our job wasn't to stop them. Our job was just to monitor them, but to delay them if we possibly can. So we put out the tank stops, which were two big metal bars, X crossed over like a big X, and we pushed them out into the road. The first lead tank was what I would describe a bulldozer. And the bulldozer had a gun on it, a big uh, uh, tank gun. And as it approached the tank, uh, I went forward and I was talking to the Israeli commander and I was basically telling them that this is United Nations uh, area, that they were prevented coming in, but obviously we can't stop you because of the force you have and that we would be reporting it back into headquarters. So the word Rubicon was already given. It was already given as soon as we realized that it was the main invasion. So basically what happened then was the first tank, basically the tank commander told us to stand back. The first tank lowered the turret and basically blew our tank stops off the road. They started coming through in streams. But the funny story about that there is they were coming through for about two hours when suddenly the whole lot stopped. They couldn't move. And I was standing out talking to uh, probably uh, Joe Quinn, probably uh, Johnny Callahan or some of the lads, Huey Waters. And this Israeli tank commander came over to me and he asked me, had I got a wire cutters? Now, this was the most sophisticated army in the world asking us for a wire cutters. So I says, yes, but what do you need it for? He says, he says, some of your barbed wire, he says, has entangled in our tr tank tracks and we can't move. Now, the road was very narrow, so they, can't, they were afraid to go left or right in case that the, the roads were mined. So they were sticking to the main road, the ones that we use, so they knew that it was safe. So basically what happened was a piece of army barbed wire held up the Israeli invasion for about three hours. Unfortunately, I couldn't give him, I couldn't give him the, the, wire cutters because that would be insist that would be assisting them in the invasion of, of Lebanon. But eventually, after about two hours waiting for this wire cutters to come along, they cut the, uh, it was actually a blade wire, to cut the wire and that allowed in the, the advance to move further up into, into Lebanon. War planes pounded Palestinian targets in Lebanon again today as Israel launched a full scale invasion against the PLO. The Palestinians say they downed three Israeli jets and one helicopter in the fighting, 
and put more than one dozen tanks out of commission. Early this morning, over 300 Israeli tanks and personnel carriers poured through UN peacekeeping forces, launching a three-pronged attack on PLO strongholds in Tyre, Nabatea, and Shaba. The aim of the invasion was to push the PLO farther north to stop missile attacks into Israel. A lot of people, for the earlier parts, when we had problems in Lebanon, and there were, we were, people were getting killed and whatnot, we were told by our, uh, the, the officers in charge and whatnot, and this was the political stance as well, to, to play these things down. When you're writing home, whatever, your family would say, I heard they were shooting or someone, the other was, that was miles away. And our orders on the standing uh, orders were uh, to keep your weapon on safety, uh, not cocked. But as soon as I got out of sight of the authorities that from the house, right boys, cock your weapon, safety catch off, because that split second it takes uh, to react, um, it could have been life or death. In the Lebanon, it was a different situation where most of the houses were flat roofs, so snipers could have been lying anywhere. And I wasn't going to take a chance with my patrolling. When you would already he was killed, uh, I wasn't going to have somebody, another casualty in my hands. And I went against the rules, but I won't uh, hold back on that. I thought I did the right thing there. And that's just the way you react. We lost 47 troops in Lebanon, like you know, outside the Congo, it's been the biggest loss of life. Um, there's a lot of people when they go overseas, they think uh, they're hard people and they'll get through the different situations out there. Like, I'll give you one example there with Cyprus was a doddle uh, compared to Lebanon. Uh, how it was called, it was a holiday camp compared to Lebanon. And uh, it was an eye opener when you went to the Lebanon then because you couldn't uh, relax and take things easy. Your rifle was your companion four to six months out there and you never left, left it out of your hand basically. And you had to have your wits about you. The air strikes continued for the third day in a row as casualties mounted on both sides. Over 300 people have died so far here, and there are fears that the toll will be even higher as the Israelis push north. But the PLO holds strong positions in southern Lebanon, and many observers here think that Israel will suffer heavy losses, even if they are successful in their objectives. Chris Harper, ABC News, Beirut. There was, there was, there was um, a case there, there was, uh, I think we remember the names of the camps, there was the Burj al and there was three camps in Beirut, they were more or less refugee camps. And um, they were bombed from the Shoot Mountains by the Syrians. Uh, and I spent two months in Beirut as quartermaster in Unifil House. And I went into the camps as well. And you can see the devastation, the bodies, the, the, their body parts, if you like, uh, from the destruction there that they weren't cleaned up fully. Uh, at the time. Do I believe that some of the lads were uh, affected? Absolutely. Uh, affected because uh, of the situation. I mean, some of them, some units had a very quiet six months. Some units had a very tense six months. So uh, being away from home, be, uh, worrying about family at home, it all, it all will play in you. There's a, a lot of cases like the PTSD uh, and if, if people don't go through situations like that, they don't understand it. And the majority of people that uh, laugh at Irish soldiers uh, were coming back and say, sure, you, you did nothing, sure, why would you be suffering uh, PTSD? You, you, you didn't uh, do anything to uh, cause that. But yet, if you're in the presence of different things happening and involved with them, it does affect you. I know that there is much more uh, hands-on with post-traumatic stress now, but the units that I served in, uh, I have not ever heard of anybody uh, 
coming back and getting a, a, a mental debrief of the situation. Even the units that served, like I, for example, the 51st during the invasion, the 46th Battalion, who dealt with a lot of uh, uh, trouble with, with the Israeli-backed militias. Maybe sometimes I might have wakened up during the night, as Margaret said, uh, that I, I must have been uh, under fire. Or They had a thing there whenever the uh, shit hit the fan, for a better word, uh, that there was groundhog, so you were put into bunkers and the, the things were going around. But it's a sight of people who didn't see. They all seen these fellas out with their hands in their pockets and out getting drunk on the odd occasion. But they didn't realise they were after doing, literally, seven days on call, 24-7. And that's really what it was. So, well, it just shows you. I ended up, like I say, totally fatigued that I was coming out in lumps. That's how fatigued you were. The body couldn't take anymore. This is after, it wasn't just one week, this is constant. So you're off a week, on a week, and then you've, uh, we were in call during that week that we were off. In 1985, uh, on the Saturday that I was uh, due to come home, on the Tuesday, I was being brought into the, the company headquarters from, from my outpost. And when uh, the Land Rover, uh, I'm not going too much into the detail of how it happened, but basically the driver of the Land Rover, uh, basically an incident happened and uh, he panicked a bit and he took off down the road and I hit a concrete wall and I was knocked unconscious and I suffered back injuries. And that was in 1985 and that prevented me from going overseas again because I had to, uh, I was off work for the best part of 18 months. At one time, I think we had people serving in about 16 countries. And without that contribution, that's, that's what other people in the world see us. We represent our country. We're the most successful peacekeepers in the world. We have the longest continuous unbroken service with the United Nations since 1958. We have had troops overseas. And since 1960, we're the first ground holding units went to the Congo, we have had people serving overseas continuously. But uh, if you look at the UN record that the Irish Army has, and it's the only country in the world that has the continuous UN record, unbroken record of service with the United Nations, and the number of lives that have been lost, and people then say it's a Mickey Mouse Army, when it's not, they went out and died in the service of peace and for the country and for the UN and for people to come and say uh, things there that we're not a professional army. Without that contribution, none of our politicians could hold their head in the international community and go to uh, heads of state meetings and whatnot. It's what the Irish Defence Force, the Naval Service and the Air Corps as well that have contributed, plus aid workers and people like that there that work through. This is how Ireland, why Ireland can hold their head up high, you know? So uh, I think uh, we're probably better known throughout for the world for, for our contribution than we are at an actually in our own home country. Again, look at the National Day of Commemoration. That's to honour those who, who died in service with the UN at home and abroad. And always at those, I think of Hugh Doherty, that I sent out to the outpost. There's an orphanage in Tebnine in, in South Lebanon, which the Irish has been contributing, or the government contributes to that, but the unit that always serves there as well donates money to that every year, and they've been very instrumental in maintaining that down through the years. Uh, it's a disgrace the way they've been treated now. Even this is why we have formed these organisations, to try and let them know that we haven't forgotten about them. But in our day, we were actually better paid than they are now. We were able to build our houses, buy our houses or whatever, now they can. Now they spend most time overseas. I think they're in about eight different countries. We were still soldiers and we did our job to the best of our ability. The army was a way of life. It's not just like a factory job, it's not like an office job. You meet so many comrades, you meet so many friends and sometimes it is hard. I found it hard, but 
No, it's great, you know. I'm, I'm out of the army now long, nearly as long as I was in it. I left in 97 and this is 2020, you know. So, yeah, people, to, people do find it difficult because the army, you have constant friends, you know. You, you fight and you fall out, but they're always there for you. Organizations like the UNE, like the UN Veterans and all that, they're, they're a means of keeping the contact going and the, the houses that they support. I know there's one in Let alone, there's one in Letterkenny, <clears throat> and there's a big one in Dublin. Uh, they're not just places for people to go and be accommodated, they're places to go where people can go and meet and chat and have a coffee. And uh, basically, if a soldier talks about his past and he talks to his friends, He's talking to people that understand them, and that would help them mentally as well, yeah. The message needs to be got out uh, to people there that we have a very good army and very dedicated soldiers. Local people didn't actually understand what the army was about and what they were doing here. They were doing the exact same thing, they were keeping the peace. And it was interesting, definitely interesting. Ask me what I do it now? Absolutely not. They haven't got the same. They haven't got the same comradeship now as they used to have then. Like I say, I was all joking aside. Whenever we got from the front lawn into the the wooden huts, and you came back in of a, a patrol, maybe at uh, eight or nine o'clock at night, you went and you had a shower, and you say, "Well, Jesus, I'm off now." Then you go to your locker. No clean shirts. And you always go to the next boy's locker just in case he had one. Nine times out of ten, you take his shirt as long as it's fitted you. You would have met them out town and they would have been given out to you for taking his shirt. If he had to wear a dirty shirt. But it wasn't, you know, that's the kind of way it was. It's just like family, that's what I'm saying. And to this day, to this very day, we're still in contact with most, you know, nearly everybody who was there then. When you, you've got 200 or 300 people there, you know, you know them for 20, 30 years and whatnot. You've served overseas with them or whatever. You find yourselves in very dangerous uh, circumstances with these people. There's bonds created there that, that, that are not created in any other walk in life, like, you know. The funny thing, if you met somebody up in Dublin, or if you're up at any of these meetings, they'll look at your ribbons. And then the conversation is going to get, what year were you there? And the, the hat alone is going to say, well, you were here, you were there, that's your... Although you've never met before, as if you were actually still part of the same team, you can understand that. You mightn't have met that person before in your life, but just because you're wearing that berry or you're wearing that ribbon, you were there and that was it. Who were you to long with? Jesus, I know, tell me, I, I, I tell me, you, do you remember the time you nearly drowned after going into the thing after? The, that's the way they've been on. Now, you think with Jesus that Ireland was only a small village. Uh, so uh, for anybody to think that the Irish army uh, does nothing, they're wrong. And it does anger the soldiers. I could keep repeating that, but that's the way I feel there. I was proud to have served I served uh, three three months short of 42 years, and I enjoyed every day of it. Um, I retired as a sergeant, and uh, I met some fantastic people, you know, some very dedicated people. This was a devastated area. Very few people were living in it, in the region of perhaps 10,000 people as most of the people had moved north as refugees out of this area because of the continuous trouble that was in this area for quite a number of years. The return to South Lebanon of a vast number of people uh, to settle here, agriculture is uh, gaining momentum. Fields are being worked now, which weren't worked for five or six years. Um, industry, commerce has, has increased a lot. And I think this must be as a result of the presence of Eulafil here. So you, you, you would think then that uh, from a peacekeeping point of view, the risks are worthwhile? I believe so, yes. And on the commencement of that operation, an additional 150,000 came back into the area. And during this period, there has been a spate of private house building, industrial building, development, etc. Unprecedented, I would say, in this part of the world. And uh, Unifil has done this for the people. 
giving them medical attention, assisting them in humanitarian areas, etc. Unifil has has produced quite a lot in this area, a lot for good. Uh, before uh, the Unifil came here, it was sometimes difficult times. But now uh, the school is open it because we have the Unifil. The presence of Unifil is very important. And uh, we are quite a people and we like to see peace. And the Unifil help us for peace. Step from the promised land, a quick step from Palestine and a heartbeat from this heart of mine. Rock fall at the wedding wall, the temple keepers fly to where time machines those great green trees to holy timber land. I was raised in the shade of the cedars of Lebanon, and I bathed in the bay where the sailors burnt the sun and gave the glass. Past the sight of land, they rode on ships to Spain for what they'd find. 